If you somehow haven't noticed by now, everything for Bass Countdowns. Naturally, Zelda games are a frequent guest on them. So let's say we count on the top 10 Zelda bosses. <laughs> Though when you really sit down and think about it, a lot of Zelda bosses are just glorified puzzles. Expose them with the dungeon's item, hit them with the sword, rinse and repeat three times, and you're done. Thus, I'm gonna rank the following bosses on how well they can make this formula work in a novel way, or in some cases, subvert it entirely. Both because sometimes the classic formula works for a reason, but we also like seeing a fun remix. I just mentioned how Zelda bosses follow a pretty simple formula. So if we want a certain boss to do well on this list, we need to make sure that they take that preconceived formula and use it in a way that not only makes the fight interesting, but also unique. Well, in Ocarina, we got something like that in the fight against Twin Rova. The Gerudo wizards Kotake and Kume await you in the depths of the Spirit Temple as they act as the final trial between you and the Spirit Medallion. They start by pelting you with magic attacks that act as opposites to the other, Kotake with ice and Kume with fire. Using the mirror shield, you need to redirect the attack to the other sister to damage them. After doing this about four times, the sisters will use their double dynamite attack and transform into the combined Twin Rova. Ganon's mom is hot. Why is she hot? Since the sisters know better than to attack you one at a time, they will pelt you with either fire or ice attacks. Unlike before, instead of redirecting the attack, you absorb the spell they were casting with the mirror shield. Be careful as you need to absorb the same element three times. And if you absorb the other in the meantime, you will need to start over. Once you get three stacks of an element, launch it at the wizard and it'll cause her to collapse so you can go in with your sword. Do this enough and hat goes kaput. Twin Rova is a great example of using the dungeon item in a fun and unique way to expose the boss's weak point. The enemy can be a bit wonky, so it is lower despite the story importance of the fight, but still a very memorable one regardless. Imagine, you've just arrived in an eerie parallel dimension. You're a little weirded out, uncertain, terrified even. But hey, you found a cool hammer and some bombs! Maybe things will go smoothly after all. But then you come to your first dungeon and... Holy it's a dinosaur. Well, that's one way to welcome someone to the Dark World. Meet the Helmosaur King, the boss for your very first dungeon in the Mirror World. He is an enormous big boy of a dinosaur with an iron face and a long scorpion-like tail. Oh, and he can shoot fireballs. That break off into more fireballs! Your only tools on you are your new magic hammer and bomb, so what do you do? It's hammer time! Put them new toys into practice! Use them to chip away at the monster's mask, which will expose his weak spot. Then when you've unmasked him, just wail into him some more. But beware, he's faster now. There's also the risk of spikes! Survive all that, and you walk away with an extra heart. That's a pretty straightforward boss fight, definitely a fun one. What really earned its spot on this list is kind of the same reason its title earned its spot on the best games list. I already mentioned how Link to the Past brought a lot of staples to the franchise, and with it, well, same thing applies to this particular boss battle, as the brought the idea of inspiring creativity when using your new tools found in the temple. Once you find the hammer and bombs, they'll be your best defense against Helmosaur, but you really gotta strategize. Your hammer is probably the best tool for cracking the beast's mask and skull, but you're gonna get really close to land a hit and be ready to spring back to safety. The bombs also do a lot of damage, but the monster moves so freaking fast that landing a hit is gonna take precise planning and accuracy. Remember I said that still boss fights are more like puzzles? Well, this proved the fact by motivating us to fight smarter, not harder, with the weapons we've been given. Zelda, as with any other kind of long-running gaming franchise that has boss battles, has had an extremely variable quality when it comes to said bosses. Some of them blow you away the very first moment and keep the hype. Others never quite seem to make their mark. This time we're talking about a boss that starts off a little slow, but has a surprisingly satisfying finish. Kaloktos is the final boss of the Ancient Cistern, and like the rest of the area, Kaloktos comes with some pretty heavy Buddhist influence. The multiple arms, the headdress, the expression, even the way he puts his arms during his fight all announce this influence. As for the fight itself, it starts out pretty... Bleh. Kalogdos takes a few swings at you with his fists, he gets those fists stuck in the ground, if you react fast enough, you can pull him apart with your new whip, leaving his giant red weak point exposed. <laughs> you do this two more times and can't help but think to yourself, is this it? But then Kalogdos shows you the ace up his sleeve, a cage closes over his weak point, and he pulls out a giant cutlass in each hand. 
Now the fight is really on! As if the spectacle of a six-armed automaton wielding a giant cutlass in each hand wasn't enough, Kalaktos becomes significantly more aggressive from this point forward, even summoning undead bokoblins to aid him. However, while he's attacking, he's about to getting his blade stuck in the earth. He pulls his arms apart once more, and you see a surprising prompt as you stand next to one of the fallen cutlasses. Open up. Look it up. With savage joy, you pick up Kalaktos' own weapon and brutally dismember him before slashing apart the cage covering his weak point and slashing that to bits too. Do this a few times, boss is defeated, but oh my gosh. As much fun as this fight is toward the end, it's docked points for three reasons. First is, first part's a little weaker. Second is that despite how satisfying the Cutlass gimmick is, yeah, it's, it's still just a gimmick. Finally, Kalatos just doesn't really have any in-game lore associated with him. He's basically just a giant robot gear who corrupts to get in your way and nothing more. But still, well deserving of 8th place on this list. Uh, cheer up guys, 8th place isn't so bad. Carl, there are only 7 acts. <laughs> As you near your escape from the thieves den and leap between worlds alongside your friend, Thief Girl, you encounter Low Rules leader of thieves, Starblind. Taking a page from Blind from A Link to the Past, you fight him at the end of a dungeon that you traverse with two people. Except this time, they exchange the boss escort gimmick in favor of a fight that's actually fine. Starblind's ordeal is that he fights like a bigger version of you, swinging around a big sword and guarding behind a big shield. And by shield, I mean a flat surface you can merge with. Yeah, you beat this guy by tricking him into lifting you behind him, giving him a big old back strike. Naturally, he catches on to your antics and resorts to some traditional hacking and slashing. Do enough damage, and he'll fall back on his old tactics. From there on, just watch your step, hit the body where it hurts, and you're done. One of the great things about this fight is that you don't even need to use any dungeon items to beat him. You can bring in the hammer, bombs, and bow if you want to but all you really need is your sword, Ravio's bracelet, and some quick big brain thinking. It's a legit thrilling boss who's not only challenging, but also encourages you to play smart and use what you have with you to its fullest. Just a heads up though, if you're playing hero mode, make sure you do the Swamp Palace first and get the blue mail before this. That spinning breath can really hurt otherwise. You guys remember Beyblades? Neither do I. Before Skyward Sword, it was pretty consistent that the dungeon item you get would be what was used to beat the boss of that dungeon. So with this in mind, the developers needed to make a boss that tested your skill with said item. One of the weirder examples of this would be in Twilight Princess where you get some weird items. Like an actual ball and chain? The Dominion Rod? The Double Claw Shot? <laughs> they just gave me a second claw shot, how cool is that? The real star to come out of this lineup was the spinner from the Arbiter's Grounds. It was almost like a skateboard that lets you traverse grooves in the wall with ease. The puzzles were pretty fun, but how the heck are you going to make a boss fight with it? Well, Twilight Princess delivered with the Twilight Fossil, Stalord. This massive skeleton starts on a quicksand pit that you need to use the spinner to gain speed and launch yourself right into its spine. Be careful, because there will be moving spikes on the rail you need to watch out for. Once you actually launch yourself, you need to avoid some undead just standing there blocking your path. Hit the spine three times, and you will end this 3D game of Brickle. Well, Brickle is fun, but how about Hopscotch? Pong? I, I, I can't think of an example of a game. Phase 2 has you going between two walls as the animated Stallard head sends you flying, and you need to chase after it. With two walls of treads, you need to bounce between them to avoid the fireball Stallard is spitting at you, and the spikes also roaming on the treads. Keep bouncing at the right time, and you'll eventually bounce into his face. Jump to the ground and strike the sword in the skull. Do it the normal three times, and you'll win this fossil fight. This battle is such a rush and very different from a lot of Zelda fights on this list. It's unique, it's fun, it uses a dungeon item in a creative way. I'm happy to include it here. Five more to go. Majora's Mask was pretty consistently good with its bosses. None of them required the dungeon item to beat. You only needed either that region's 4 mask or just the basic bow with really good timing. While there are far fewer of them than most other games, all of them felt really unique and interesting. Out of the main four, the most memorable was easily Goat. Got? Got? Goot, goot, I am goot. The giant quadruped, that guy. 
Having obtained the Goron Mask earlier, you'd think a boss fight designed around it would be a 1v1 brawl. No, it's a race, and it is awesome! Guts runs around the track like a crazy person, it's up to you to put him down. To do this, you have to spin dash and attack him with your spikes, which is actually pretty violent when you think about it. Hitting him after a jump downs him and lets you get some equally satisfying punches in. Of course, God tries to make this difficult for you with various hazards like bombs, rocks falling and you die, and lasers! It's an incredibly fun, fast-paced fight that offers a welcome change of pace from other bosses in the series. And since Majora's Mask lets you refight bosses, I find myself coming back to this guy for the fun of it. Okay, yeah, I beat him multiple times to get the sword upgrade and the frog side quest, but this guy made that feel less like a chore. Now, some people may find Stalor better, but no. Got nails the fun factor better. Super Zelda Kart is better than Link's Pro Skater. Fight me. And yeah, of course you can cheese Got with fire arrows. But if you do, I must ask you, why do you hate fun? I notice that good Zelda bosses evolve, change, and adapt to fight you. They keep you on your toes. Link is a rather perceptive and thinking man's fighter. He sits back and waits for weaknesses or openings to capitalize on, analyzing his opponents. So it's nice to fight a smart enemy that changes up its tactics when they realize its regular stuff isn't working. Ganondorf is not a smart opponent compared to Link. He has so much strength it's unholy, sure, but nearly every time he's been defeated, it wasn't by being overpowered, it was by being outwitted, outskilled, or outwilled. And this makes sense. Ganondorf worships power, so he believes that's all he needs to win. To be blunt, Ganondorf is predictable, and this makes him very, very beatable. It doesn't make him a bad villain, far from it. He's a monster, a force of nature, he does that very well. We fought him many times throughout the series, so which iteration of him is the best? Well, Ocarina has fantastic atmosphere, and that Twilight Princess music utterly slaps. Pfft, come on, Wind Waker wins no contest. Having fought through his phantom and puppet forms, Leek finally comes face to face with the King of Evil himself. With the Great Flood returning more powerful than ever, everything is on the line for this final battle. But this isn't just Link against Ganondorf. Zelda fights alongside you with light arrows. This results in you having to fend off and distract him while she takes aim. All the while, the very ocean itself is collapsing above you, which gives a great sense of tension to the whole fight. But I think what especially makes this battle interesting is how each Triforce is utilized in this fight. Ganon possesses the Triforce of power, meaning you can't take him down using just your strength. To counter this, Zelda, possessing the Triforce of Wisdom, uses her wits to come up with a plan, and you, as Link, bearer of the Triforce of Courage, have to trust Zelda's plan even though it puts you in serious danger. It all comes to an end when you finish him off by stabbing him right in the forehead. How fitting that the game initially derided for being too cartoony gets the most metal death ever. That is the most metal thing I ever heard in my whole life. There's also a surprisingly sympathetic portrayal of Ganondorf. Due to Hyrule collapsing, he'd have nothing to rule over even if he did succeed. His only motivation at this point is sheer spite and resentment. Even the king points out that they were similar due to their obsession with the old world. Given that this is the last we saw of him in this timeline, it's a fitting send-off for Link's nemesis. Though I gotta be honest, the way he punches Link right before the fight is a bit... silly. <laughs> It's one thing to venture through the dungeon. It's another to fight the boss waiting for you in the dungeon. But what if one of your bosses was the dungeon? Stop it. You're talking crazy. Am I talking crazy? Well, yeah, usually. But this time I'm serious. Breath of the Wild added a new twist by having the dungeons also be bosses. More specifically, they're the divine beasts, giant machines piloted by the champions of Hyrule to help defeat Calamity Ganon. Yeah, that didn't work out. At all. The champions fell and Calamity Ganon took control of the Divine Beast to bring chaos throughout the land. All four Divine Beasts are cool in their own right, but for this list, yeah, I'm going with Veruda. This mechanical pachyderm was the beast for Mipha, aka Fish Waifu for Life, who sorry what, and was possessed by Water Blight Ganon to bring torrential rain to the land. Now, the Zoras acknowledge that they'll probably be okay. They're fish people after all, but 
they're a little bit concerned about everyone else. So you can face the Divine Beasts in any order, but Varuda is more often than not the first boss. But to get anywhere near him, you're gonna need help. Luckily, in comes Sidon, Mipha's little brother all grown up and ready to avenge Best Sister. He acts as your own personal jet ski while you circle the enormous elephant. To get inside, you'll have to swim up waterfalls, bursting over the sides, and make one of the most awesome slow motion shots as you shoot the four pink orbs. Only then will you gain access to the temple within. Now say it with me, kids. Sounds easy enough, right? Yeah, no. Valruta ain't opening its doors without a fight. It throws enormous ice blocks at you, which have to be quick to shoot down and leeches ice spikes that chase you in the water. Once you hit all four orbs, you quickly get inside. Then you just have to traverse the inner machinations of the machine and beat water by Ganon, and boom! You get a free elephant beast. Even though Varuta is technically the prelude to the actual boss, Water Black Ganon, I just think Varuta is a cooler concept. It's fast paced, hectic, and the way you beat it is just cool. Plus, as I said in Water Bosses, it gets more points for having actual water involved. Pfft, more like Ice Black Ganon. Why did they call him that? Zant, you know, the crazy ex-boyfriend you have to be for more for you to date Minna? Wait, that's all right. Of course, we got a second Twilight Princess boss on here. Twilight Princess bosses are awesome. I definitely wasn't planning on including one Twilight Princess boss and having it be style or purely for the fun factor. I wasn't, no matter what the Twilight Princess fanboy and my writer staff says. Up to this point, Zelda didn't really have as many villains as memorable as the Big G. Sure, Vati was a screaming child and Majora was more of a looming threat than an in-your-face villain, but what about personality. Zant brought a combination of pure menacing aura with deep-rooted insanity that made him someone you thought you'd figured out when you really didn't. When you finally confront this bozo in the Palace of Twilight, any preconceived notions you had of him were erased and replaced with one of the longest but most complete fights in the series. This fight takes place over six phases. Count that. Six! Each one getting crazier than the last. The first phase is on the forest temple where you need to use the Gale Boomerang to knock him out of the air and onto the poison water below. Second phase, Goron Mines. Use Iron Boots. Don't get knocked off. Wait for the loony to become tired. Third phase, Lake Bed Temple. He summons giant versions of his helmet and you need to use the claw shot to draw him out when they open. Fourth phase, back in the forest temple. Eh, you need to knock yourself into the pillar you're standing on to knock him down. Fifth phase, running out of breath here. Snow Peak, where he becomes a giant, you need to use the ball and chain to attack his foot and make him become small again. And finally, sixth phase, outside Hyrule Castle, challenges you to one final duel. No dungeon items, just you, him, and swords. Well, I say that, and he is just teleporting around, attacking randomly what looks like what happens if you give a kid two swords and 50 pounds of sugar. Despite that, it's a challenging finish to a long fight, and if you aren't careful, your journey could easily end here. Zant really is one of the best villains in the series, and his boss fight feels like a fitting send-off, making you use multiple dungeon items and your wits to best him in the end. Still don't know how cracking his neck at the end kills Ganondorf, but... Is that a symbolism thing? But, you know, I'm not paid to question things. No, really, that's the motto of the Kingdom Hearts fan. Vati, Minish Cap Four Swords Adventures. Boss so nice, we fight him twice. Eox, Phantom Hourglass. Actually makes good use of the DS's two-screen functionality. Burn, Spirit Tracks. A test of patience as Link and Zelda fight <gasps> together? Glukenspiel, Cadence of Hyrule. Weaponized DDR against a Xylophone Hydra. Gosh, I love this series. So, for the number one pick, you're probably expecting something a bit personal. Boss fight that stuck with me more than any other boss, regardless of how much better others are in comparison. A boss that would really give this list the personal touch that makes it stand out among any other Zelda boss list. Oh, sorry, I just been looking through the comments of the previous two videos, and apparently a lot of y'all aren't happy about me putting stuff from Majora's Mask so high. Yes, again! Uh, guys, I tried. I really, really tried not to put Majora at number one. I've already talked to death about how good it is, and this would be the third time something from Majora's Mask tops a list this month. But 
other than being a speed chase, everything I like in a Zelda boss fight is present here. Majora already has a reputation for being one of the most terrifying villains in gaming, with Holy Terminator at the three-day gunpoint in the shape of an angry space rock. So I'm fair, once you do get to challenge it, the fight would be equally as unsettling. When you first enter Majora's world, it's unlike anything one would expect. Instead of some dark, twisted realm, it's bright and peaceful. Too peaceful. Oh, children wearing masks with the previous bosses running around the open field. <laughs> As we all know, children are always innocent. Beneath a large tree in the distance. Oh, trees have never been bad. Ah, yes, there! A child wearing Majora's mask. They ask you to play with them. Where are you going with this? Ah, yes, it was a trap, and I fell for it. Shoot. You just got pranked! <laughs> Majora starts off in its mask form, attacking by spinning its tendrils and shooting lasers at you. It's later assisted by the remains of the bosses you defeated, in which then you must shoot them down all the same. In that whole phase, you listen to an aggressive version of Majora's already eerie theme, setting up with just what sort of threat you're bound to face as you progress. You can easily get bum-rushed if you're not careful. Once the mask is defeated, it forms a body and starts... Dancing? Yeah, moonwalks, twirls like a ballerina, does the Kazatsuki kick, and makes the McDonald's pose. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. To be fair, you can't be a chaotic deity if you're predictable. Considering it still catch you off guard and hit you pretty hard, I'd say it really shows. If anything, it's one heck of a setup for the final phase, Majora's Wrath. In this phase, Majora goes all in. Twirling with his whip, smacking, tossing you around, and so many explosive spinners to clutter the field. Majora's move is to be absolutely savage, especially if you're not fully equipped to deal with it. Couple that with Majora's morbid design and even more hostile music, and this fight is bound to leave a mark in your gaming trials. The fight is both a mechanical and visual wonder. Not only is Majora a challenging and versatile boss, but the atmosphere is perfect. The way the game builds up Majora in all its viciousness, somberness, and even sudden goofiness really builds this almost childlike chaotic nature taken to the horror form that Majora is meant to represent. Sure, if you have all the masks and do all the trials, you can get the fierce Dini mask to mop the boss with, but given how much you had to do to get that, I'd say getting the sweep the otherwise morbid boss is fair game. Plus, it makes you ponder. Why would Majora even give you such a mask to begin with? Is it really so cocky that it believes you won't beat it even with the strongest mask? Does it have just a twisted sense of honor, or is it a defeatist deep down? Or is it something else? Something far more sinister? We don't know for sure, but it's all the more to think about with this already strange fight. Majora's final stand is both fantastic and terrifying. It is unlike anything Zelda had and has since then accomplished. And for all we know, it will remain that way for a while. I'm Josh Scorcher, and stay tuned for the end of Zelda Month, where we take a look at the denizens of Hyrule and what they offer to the table. <laughs> oh! Preferably the subtle ones. Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for Tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.